Our sins are many, but his mercy is more indeed. This morning, we'll be preparing for the Lord's Supper by looking at Titus 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can begin turning there. If you don't have a Bible, some men are going to make their way to the front, and they're going to be walking down the aisles. And if you don't have a Bible, please put your hand in the air, and they will make sure you get one so you can follow along with us this morning. And in a few minutes, we will drink from a cup and we'll eat a piece of bread as a reminder of the Lord's death. And and this time in our service is reserved for those who are followers of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Christ, my prayer is that you would listen closely as we look together at God's word. I would even encourage you, pray that God would open your eyes to see what he has revealed in his word. But in a little bit, when we pass some trays around, if you are not a follower of Christ, uh, we'd ask that you just would allow the tray to pass by you without taking the the bread and and the cup that's in there. And our time this morning, preparing for the Lord's table, will be spent looking at Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, looking at how God saved us, And we'll read the whole passage, and then we'll zero in on verses 4 through 7. So Titus 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men. For we ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the kindness and affection of our God and Savior appeared, He saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In verses 1 through 3, We see the main command of this passage, and it is to remind believers how they are to act in this life. And in verse 3, the reason for these instructions is given. The reason is because of who we once were before Christ. We too were foolish and disobedient, deceived and slaved to our sin. We had evil thoughts and evil intentions, and we did evil against one another. But something radically changed who we are. Something happened that brought our slavery to sin to an end, and that changed how we interact with others. And look at verse 4. But when the kindness and affection of our God and Savior appeared... We we were once enslaved to our sin, disobedient. We hated one another. We hated God. But God's kindness and his love for us appeared. And in verse 5, we then see the main idea, what would compel believers to heed Titus' commands? What did God's kindness and love, his affection, accomplish when they arrived in our lives? He saved us. We were foolish, disobedient, enslaved to our sin, and we were spending our lives hating one another, deceived about what is important. We were in need of saving, of rescue. And God's kindness and affection accomplished that rescue. One verse five, Titus tells us how God did not accomplish this rescue, not by works that we did in righteousness. If our works could save us, we wouldn't have needed a savior. We needed someone else to save us because we were trapped in our sin. We needed God to act, and he did. The next thing we see is the standard by which God acted. What criteria did he use to determine if he would save us? 
Was it those who had sinned the least, whose slavery to sin was not as entrenched as others, who had done more good to offset the bad than others? No, it was not by works, but according to his mercy, that mercy we just sung about, according to his mercy, according to undeserved kindness that was shown to us. God looked at us in our helpless condition, not able to save ourselves, and he acted and he saved us. And next, continue looking at verse 5. By what means did God save us? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. We needed to be washed from our iniquity. We needed to be regenerated. That is, we needed to be given new life because in our sin we were dead in regard to God. And that's what the Holy Spirit did in the life of every genuine believer He changed us from the inside out. He made us new. He changed our relationship to sin. He ended our slavery to it, and he freed us from its eternal consequences. And in verse 6, we see more about how this regeneration, this recreation, this washing and renewing by the Holy Spirit took place. Notice in verse 6, God poured out his Holy Spirit upon us richly. He wasn't stingy. He poured him out. And he did it through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus' perfect life, death on the cross, and resurrection from the dead, taking sin on himself from us, dying as our substitute, and paying the price of our sin. Through him and his work alone did we receive this work of God. God poured out his Spirit on us. So here we see the God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, all acting in coordination with one another to save us. And in verse 7, we see the glorious aim and purpose of God in our lives of his saving work. So that being justified by his grace, we would become heirs an inheritance that would be ours. The washing and regenerating work of God in the believer was so that we could be justified, declared righteous by his grace. We are declared righteous by God, not because of what we have done, but purely on account of God's mercy and his kindness and his grace and grace that is unmerited, undeserved. God's kindness and love appeared to bestow mercy and grace upon us so that he might then declare us righteous. And why is our righteousness so necessary? Because our life does not end in this world. Our life goes on beyond the grave. Look at the second half of verse 7. So that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's justifying grace is so that we would inherit something, that he would make us heirs to the hope of eternal life. God declared us righteous that he might actually make us and begin to make us fit for eternal life with him. Believer, consider what God has done for you this morning. Consider what you were, what... God the Father has done through the Holy Spirit in washing you and giving you new life through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross to make us fit for the life to come with him. Pour out your heart in gratitude for this work this morning. And may God's kindness cause you to worship this morning as you remember the crushed body of Jesus and his blood poured out on the cross for you as you partake of the symbols of of that once and for all payment for our sin that we read about in Hebrews this morning. And if we are in Christ, that has secured for us a hope of eternal life. Not a hope, maybe it'll happen, but an assurance. And if you don't know Christ this morning, again, please allow the plates to pass you by without taking from them, as this is a remembrance of Christ for those who have hope and trust in Christ alone for salvation. But as you listen again to God's word proclaimed, don't leave here today without talking to someone about what it means to be right with Christ, to know him as your savior. Men, you can come forward. When your hearts are prepared to take communion, uh, please take it on your own, and then I will come up here in a few minutes. 
when we're all done, and I'll lead us in prayer for a few minutes.